um, in a very brief amount of time before Leona starts, I just wanted to situate what I could surmise or guess she's going to provoke us with. And I was actually very much thinking about what Tony just asked Leona about. And, you know, Mr. LaRouche has been very clear that we're in a completely new system. And I'll go through a couple examples of that. But what is a new system? It's not that we're no longer going with what the British did. We're going with a type of system that really provokes the minds and souls of the population. And that's why I think this question of helium-3 is, is very useful because the idea, what, what is that the essence of being human is action, actually an ability to be self-critical and to know what you don't know. And that that is actually the job of legislators or government, you know, is for is to actually provoke people into that state, that self-critical state. And a good example of this came up over the last couple of days where, you know, people have sort of, you know, there's, there's a deeper degree to which we can really take in what Lynn is saying in terms of this idea that there is a new system now that's taking over. And a good example of this is the fact that most of us, even the better of us, still hold on to this idea that money has value. And it's a huge, huge block to political action. And this was completely blown out of the water in a few ways because the assets of this financial system have absolutely no value. And the more this new system takes over, the more that's clear. And an example of this, and this is sort of, you know, a technical thing, and, you know, people could ask questions about this, but, you know, the 12 largest banks uh, over the last several months have had to put together something called a living will. And the idea of a living will is, if there is a crisis or a stress to your bank, how would you respond? Now, there's some details to this, but essentially the Dallas Federal Reserve Chairman, uh, Thomas Honig, was very clear over the last couple of days that none of the living wills of the top 12 major banks were adequate. Why? Because through various schemes, they still want to hold on to all of their assets at full value, specifically their derivatives. But what he's saying as one of the Federal Reserve heads is the value of these banks has no value. Right? So essentially, within the establishment itself, you could say, there is an acknowledgment that this, this bubble is a bubble. You know, these banks are trying to say, oh, if there's an emergency, you know, um, uh, we'll take our insurance money, you know, we'll do this, we'll do that, and, um, and we'll take it uh, before we even know for sure one of our derivatives is going to fail. And Honig says, you know, it's definitely going to fail. And, you know, it's funny the way these guys think because it's all, people are, everybody lies to try to keep the illusion that everything's fine. Everybody lies. Even the person on the street lies. Um, and, you know, what kind of culture do you have where everybody lies? I remember, you can't really be self-critical when you're lying to yourself and, and, and thinking your money is worth something. But, um... I remember in 2007, I was in Washington, D.C., and a couple of our organizers went to an event for the, um, the uh, what's the, the grouping that ensures people's deposit? The FDIC, the FDIC yeah. yeah. And it was the top major banks, a lot of the banks that were, this was in July of 2007, beginning of July of 2007, so think about that date. The top major banks are there. Sheila Bear was there, who was either the vice chair or the chair of the Federal Reserve at the time. And the whole theme of this several-hour, day-long event was, look, 
we have never needed. We pay in, you know, every year to the FDIC in case there's an accident. And there hasn't been an accident since 1932. So could we have our money back? At least some of it? We've been giving the government an awful lot of money to insure us, and we're doing A-OK. -okay. These guys are liars. So, you know, we really just we have to be completely vicious on this question of people's money. And, you know, I'll just say as a counterpoint to that, I mean, just to, to expose how bankrupt this system is and how Obama, Wall Street, the British have nothing to offer, take the example of the economic sanctions against Russia. And think about yourself, right? Because we were telling people about what Moonshaw was saying or whatever the heck his name is, that these sanctions would be the equivalent of an atomic bomb, right? Some of us believed him, some of us, you know, cited him as a source, etc. Well, guess what? They weren't. Why? Because this system has no power anymore. What LaRouche is saying is truthful. You know, Europe in the United States try to wage sanctions against Russia because they think money has power. We think they have power. But lo and behold, the more they added sanctions, what happened? The more it added to the collapse not only of the financial system of Europe, but the idea that we need to break from the European Union. Because, you know, these smaller, you know, former Soviet nations, they're, they're actually thinking about leaving the Euro because they can't give food to Russia anymore, and you have nations that are losing 15, 20, 30 percent of their income. So this new system is taking over, and replacing this one that we, we've always known, LaRouche forecast 50 years ago, inevitably would collapse. But this new system is taking over. It's here. In fact, LaRouche said, if you want to go have a good laugh, you should go to Wall Street and just say goodbye to all these guys, because, <laughs> you know, they're all going to be in jail pretty soon. And, <laughs> and and that's what we're looking at and what you're seeing right now. And, you know, it just goes to show how powerful fighting for principle is because, you know, how many people here thought a few years ago that Russia, China, India, Argentina, these nations would ally around the highest ideas. And they don't totally know. I'll say this. One, of it, one aspect of this is Lyndon LaRouche. You know, it is John Quincy Adams in China. It is Leibniz in Russia. It is, it is this historical process that we've created. But they're also challenging themselves um, within their own cultures and with their own self-critical recognition that LaRouche is right and that this whole monetarist system of the last 30, 40 years is crap and has nothing to offer. It's not a question of, you know, is Russia, China good? They're willing to be self-critical. The question is, is the United States willing to do the same thing? Because, you know, this idea of mining the moon for helium-3, I mean, we don't know how to do that yet. You know, we don't even necessarily know exactly, you know, how this new canal through Nicaragua is going to work. The point is they're educating their young people to try to figure it out. How will it affect the water system? How will it affect this, that, and the other thing? You know, but there's a real commitment to doing things that have never been done before. And you take this, you know, Egypt, right? Another example of how the system is changing. A year ago, we, Obama puts in the Muslim Brotherhood. This year, Obama gets slighted by al-Sisi because he wants to meet with Putin and discuss building a second Suez Canal. Well, why are they doing it? To make money? Sure, they're going to make an extra, I think, you know, $13 billion a year or something. But what is that the Black Sea, the gateway to? Africa. They're thinking about the future. And this is something that's, you know, funded the way Hamilton funded the United States. So, you know, I think what Leona is going to go through is probably going to be pretty incredible because she's done some really incredible work and there's a lot more um, that could be gone through. But, you know, if we have questions, people could take them over the next couple of minutes. But I think, you know, the most important thing 
is we actually have to recognize that there is this new system and we have to recognize within ourselves what blocks we have in terms of recognizing its existence. And there's a lot developing you know, throughout the world that's very exciting. And if we in the United States make the decision to impeach Obama, pass Glass-Steagall, and adopt LaRouche's four laws, the rate of, the, of creativity of this planet will be unstoppable. And so that's, you know, that's our mission. Our mission is to do what we've never done before and have in our minds um, a society that is governed by that type of tension and not by popular opinion. So essentially that's just what I wanted to bring up before Leona got started. And um, if people have a few questions, but we should try to start exactly at 7.30. Yeah. I haven't been to one of your meetings before, but I'm really curious about the value of helium and what its potential is. Well, that's actually what Leona's going to go through. So I will, I will defer to a higher authority. <laughs> Are you going to say something, Sean? No. But if Leona doesn't answer you adequately, I, um, I'll i give you her phone number. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I guess we can all get it's ready. It's 19. We've got more time. Um, well, I was planning to be quick, thinking we'd be really late. I don't know if people have questions, but I will say there's this statement. It's very short on our website. It's a few paragraphs long called A New System by Mr. LaRouche and it's really worth everybody reading through that several times and sometimes the shorter things are actually uh, the most challenging so I would definitely recommend people get that and read it. I heard that you will uh, this will kind of be advanced in two weeks. Could you tell us about that? Well, gee, was that a setup? <laughs> We're going to be having a town hall meeting on the 30th of this month in Pasadena on this question of the future. It's going to be what, from 11 to 4? We're going to perform selections from Mozart's Book of Queen as we celebrate the death of the British Empire and head towards a system of true immortality for mankind. And there'll be discussions on the water crisis and how we're going to solve it from the standpoint of the universe, which the loop system, which I think Leona will go through, um, and you know, a political strategic discussion. But, yeah, people should come. I mean, because we're at a point now where, and this is why what Leona is doing is so important. We actually have to understand things we've never un understood before because we're about to implement completely new concepts. And it's very exciting, but it is a real challenge. And you know, that's why I think um, this town hall meeting is really important because it's funny, you know, this poll came out, which I think a lot of people have seen, that seventy six percent of the American population realizes that their children or thinks that their children are going to have a worse future than they have. And I will be a little bit bold in saying that that's actually not true. Because either their children are going to be a part of this new development bank with Russia, China, and India and uh, become real scientific, artistic minds, or, you know, they probably won't, they won't exist. So, you know, most people in the population they realize they realize there's something wrong, you know, deeply wrong, and there is something deeply wrong. But um, most of them don't actually realize we're on the verge of, of actually completely shifting that. So it's very exciting. So everyone should come to this town hall meeting. Yeah, more examples on the. I know Leon is going to go over the helium three, but. Uh, we haven't yet built a fusion reactor that can use helium-3. So we actually only have computer models of what we expect. 
But this is this idea of Rush. I mean, she could probably go through the technical things, but there's stuff we don't know. But the point is that we have to acknowledge there are things we don't know and fight for bringing them, bringing them forward. We're, we're actually in the same place with fusion. We were when Kennedy announced we're going to the moon in terms of scientific problems, technological problems of actually doing that. And from the standpoint of the minds of young people in this country, we're probably even much further back than that. <laughs> you know, China actually intends to graduate by the year 2020 2,000 uh, students as nuclear engineers. Which is pretty funny because you know they're going to be working on fusion, something they haven't discovered. But that's this idea the Rush is, is bringing up about you know knowing what you don't know, but being willing to commit your energy to that. Because you know what kind of nation says we're going to invest all of this money into doing something we don't know how to do yet, or we're not sure is going to work? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's crazy. It's almost like saying in 1962 you're going to go to the moon. <laughs> Yara appears to try to be speaking. Oh. Did you unplug the uh, microphone? <coughs> no, I didn't unplug it. The, uh, we also have guests. Like Can you hear me? Okay. So, let's see here now. Okay. Can I be heard, Jim? We yeah. Can, we can hear you fine. Okay. Okay, I'm going to start, and I'll cover, I'm going to go through um, some of the things that Alexandra did just go through, but also with some of um, some of the things that Mr. LaRouche more recently said about this strategic situation. And hold on one second. Okay. Um, so I've some, as some of you know, and um, well, as some of you know. Mr. LaRouche has emphatically announced that helium-3, lunar helium-3, so helium, helium from the moon uh, for fusion energy and, and other reasons is the most important thing on the table right now. And I know that this is a paradox for people and I've already, you know, there are already a couple of questions that have come up and I think that's very good. I think it's a very good paradox to, to struggle with. Um, and I, I have seen that people have been working with Mr. LaRouche for a long time, people who were just, just running into um, Mr. LaRouche and this organization's ideas um, have all had, I, I've seen sort of three reactions that are very common. Um, can you mute you, yourself? Yes, sorry. Okay. Um, one is sheer jubilation. So one is excitement about this idea. Um, one is actually horror. And I'll go through why I think that why I think that that is one reaction. And another reaction is sort of both, but at uh, in equal extremes. <laughs> Um, not just a um, sort of medium between the two. I think it is, it's, um, part of the confusion comes from the intensity of the situation. And the situation is very intense. Uh, you know, every day we see the type of uh, horrors, the type of genocide that you thought only occurred in, in history. Um, but actually is occurring right now and is is covered very little in the press and you sort of see it in its full raw form on when YouTube videos and so on um, and you see the economy just so horrible horrible to the point where you have you know it's been years now where there was a soaring suicide rate in Greece and it's these terrible conditions that you see right now. And now the question is, why does Mr. LaRouche think that 
talking about helium-3 and mining the moon and fusion is so important right now when this is also the, the man who has, has made this whole um, war situation up front, made it the, uh, the leading issue and made it very clear that we have to uh, that the population has to be aware of just how close to world war nuclear annihilation war we have been in and I think um, uh, so one is this the intensity of the situation I think that causes this extreme reaction um, and I want to address that. The other thing is why helium-3, which is the question that you had also asked, is why helium-3 fusion of all the different things you could possibly promote that are good? Um, why specifically that? Okay, so, um, you know, of all the, uh, the... With the first one, which is the intensity of the situation, why is he talking about fusion and sort of um, something that's so-called in the future? Um, you know, the, the same. I've actually gotten this question several times. If fusion is so far in the future, it's at the mo at the least ten years away. The best estimates are ten years away. The most practical estimates are so are fifteen, twenty years away, and the most common term is thirty, always thirty years away. So why would you talk about that right now in, with, when we're facing such dire situations? And um, the, this question was actually posed to Mr. LaRouche just last week himself. And he had this interesting response, I thought. Uh, he said, just supersede it. And at first I thought this was sort of treating the subject lightly. Um, but after... a a week or so of development every day I realized that actually this is a very precise answer and uh, in the context of the thing that the things that the events that Alexandra has mentioned um, and for San Francisco you probably have gone through some of these events as well you've seen what ha has happened what the reaction has been uh, to a actions that are not against the rules but entirely outside of the rules and so you know we've been living in uh, especially since 2000 you've been living in this very insane uh, reaction to the collapse and to what extent it was planned to have this reaction or you know that we can discuss, but the um, you know the transatlantic system has been has been in this complete spiral down and down and this sort of self feeding process where uh, we've cut the budget, we've continued an increasing um, an accelerating bail out, and now a bail in, um, and have no capability. Uh, to deal with things that in this day and age we should be able to deal with, like a drought. Droughts are not new. Uh, they are not a new invention, in other words. Um, and so this is... Um, but and at the same time, at, during this period, what's happened is you've seen now with uh, I think the first thing that came on prominently into the scene was this whole Argentina situation. So Argentina was put into the situation where they were cho they were to choose to bankrupt themselves or to bankrupt themselves, and they chose neither really. And uh, the whole world went with it. And for people who know, uh, who are a little older, who have just been around Mr. Larouche for. Um, a while, know that Mr. LaRouche has been pushing countries to 
unilaterally, basically, break from this um, this looting system for decades. And he's had several different situations where people almost did it. And at that time, it really required whole blocks, like, for example, all of South America to break with the IMF, which was one case, um, and so on. But this is really a case now where this has happened, where Argentina decided to go against uh, what was, you know, uh, considered court justice, which was completely unjust, and uh, the rest of the world went with it. Uh, there was another, this, this BRICS case where the BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and South Africa, um, came together, created a development bank, development bank first time since Bretton Woods, so it's first time since 1945. There, people came together and created a development bank and had contracts following that uh, that say what they're going to build. Um, sanctions. You guys, you guys mentioned this as well. The whole sanction fiasco, I, you know, it's interesting. I, I found all of these articles going through um, what they, people were planning once Putin fell because the sanctions were going to work so well. And of course, well, no, the big surprise was that Russia's economy actually grew during that period, during the first part of this period, and uh, Europe's economy suffered very, very badly. And so, uh, now that's not all, in, that's not in a vacuum. And it's not, it, the, what I'm laying out right now is not something that's determined. What you want to start to get a picture of is all the different dynamics that are that are operating, right? So you and this this whole insane Blair doctrine, this new um, this uh, the the end of sovereign nation states is still operating, but at the same time there is this new current, and that's that's also operating, and that's sort of the environment that we're operate that we're uh, that everything is playing out in. And this is what Mr. LaRouche is intervening into right now. So, like I said, he said uh, helium-3 in the moon. Now, helium-3 is an isotope of helium. So, same thing that you fill your balloons with, and yet not. It's very different. Um, the China has very explicitly, many times, said, uh, or officials from China have said, they are going to the moon and they're going to mine helium-3 from the moon and bring it back to use it for fusion. And I'll get to the, that aspect, how that works in a, in a second, but first I want to point out that the, what the context of all of this is. Now, China has... Um, they have uh, they have decided in this well there, there's a combination of things one they've come to a point of maturity and a lot of people think that a sort of a lot of people think of China as this uh, cheap labor market that copies everything and um, has no original thinking basically and it's even been said by our president, but uh, it's totally untrue. That assessment is untrue. And what has happened is that Mr. Rouge called it sort of a, a, an age of maturing, um, a point where the, the culture has matured, which is they've come to a point where they did, they sent out a lot of people, they sent out their population to gather the, um, the knowledge of the world sort of the modern era. And um, they did for a relatively short amount of time, actually, well, basically one generation develop. And now they're at a point where they're producing unique ideas. And um, that 
really came to fruition right around uh, basically the early two, two, you know, two thousands, and it coincided with this period, which is of the collapse of the two thousand seven two thousand eight collapse. Now, during that time, like I said, we went for full bailout, and they accelerated their development. They uh, did not give in to, for example, all these threats that they should devalue the, their yen and, and so on. They didn't do that. They, they did the opposite. So what they did actually was they built um, the world's largest many, many things. So they built the world's largest dam system in 2007, the Three Gorges Dam. Um, they built uh, thousands um, they're building right now 25 nuclear plants and by 2020 are planning to build uh, to triple their capacity basically their power capacity from nuclear fission um, and I mean I think the best of all the different things they're building uh, they built 6,000 almost 7,000 miles of rail in this period so Seven, let's see, 2007 to 2013 is when, when that number is from. They built 7,000 miles of rail, and this is high speed rail. For people, is high speed rail is like about 200 miles an hour, and we don't have that doesn't exist in the United States. The only thing that's planned is for a possibly 2028 rail from LA to San Francisco. Um, I think the best indication of where they're going is uh, the fact that they plan to graduate 2,000 fusion scientists by 2020. And I think that's a really good indication of all the different things that they're building. That's a that's probably one of the best indications of the fact that they plan to be a unique contributor. To society. Now, Mr. LaRouche said, "Okay, this era is defined by a, a a redefining of value. What value actually is? Things that were previously valuable are now filth, unworthy. Uh, I think uh, Ben even said it was criminal. Um, things that." were not valuable, were not even thought of, like for example helium-3, have now become incredibly valuable. And um, now during this, now the, the question is, um, yes, okay, China's going in this direction, that's what this whole BRICS development is, and this, this, uh, sort of tide that's coming in is is obviously um, in the opposite direction from this whole depopulation agenda that has been operating for so long. Now, uh, why is it that Mr. LaRouche has chosen out of all those different very good things helium-3 and fusion? Now, I want to take up fusion for a second, and then I want to bring it back to this question of uh, how this is supposed to address why now, why would we talk about this now during this very intense moment? So, okay, so. Uh, I'll just go through some of the basics, and I'm sorry this, if this is people know it already. Um, so helium is an isotope of helium. Like I said, it's chemically exactly the same as helium. You would not be able to tell if you had a pure helium-based balloon, helium-3-based balloon. It would be exactly the same as helium-4-based balloon. Uh, it might be very, very, very slightly lighter. <laughs> um, 
But so chemically, it has no difference from helium. Nuclear, from a nuclear standpoint, that little bit of difference makes all the difference in the world. And um, that actually, that distinction is uh, very indicative of this new paradigm, which really is what Mr. LaRouche is discussing, and really is what the, the driver is that uh, he's now called helium-3 fusion from the moon. Um, so what do I mean by that? Um, Okay, so let's see. Let's look at a couple of things. Okay, so this is what fusion is in the textbook. Okay, it's taking two very light elements. These these two names, deuterium and tritium, are actually two versions of hydrogen. And they're just heavier versions of hydrogen, but they again are have chemically the same uh, reaction. But on a nuclear scale, um, that little bit of difference is what gives you the capability to do fusion or not. So you, you can f certain combinations of atoms, when you get them uh, close enough together at a high enough energy, they will fuse, creating two different elements, two other elements. So this is true alchemy, right? You're actually creating other elements, like gold out of mercury type of, or type of thing. Um, and in the process, a little bit of mass is lost. And it's not lost, it's just converted. It's converted to energy. At, and that, en the amount, that amount of energy can be calculated from Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared. So that's the textbook version. Um, what most people know, this is sort of small picture, but what most people know about fusion, we usually when fusion is mentioned, um, I talk about the amount of energy that you get. And the amount of energy is incredible in the sense of uh, per pound, for example. Are people having a hard time hearing? Uh, per we can hear you loud and clear in Los Angeles. Okay. So um, per pound of fusion fuel, you get a million, in this case, uh, an, on the order of a million more power, more energy, than you get per pound of petroleum, coal, or wood. It's on sort of the same order as fission, but more, much more. So that's the sort of textbook reason of why you want to pursue fusion. And, you know, it's, it's sort of something that's more obvious. Yes, if you had fusion, then the energy problems would be solved. Um, there wouldn't be wars over oil and, and so on. And that's the, sort of the usual explanation of why you need to go fusion. But, um, that's not what Mr. LaRouche is talking about. And those things are all still true, but he is really looking at something much, much higher. So this is what I want people to really associate fusion with. Um, so this is, this is an, actually an image. It's a sort of animation of one of the fusion reactors. It's, it's for people who don't know or haven't taken a tour of it. Um, this particular one is at Livermore National Labs um, in Northern California, and um, this is 192 lasers shooting at a little tiny thing that's about the size of a pencil eraser. And um, in this machine, they create a, a density that is a thousand times that of the sun, the core of the sun. One of the lasers that they produce for this for this purpose, though they they didn't end up using it for this one, it's doing some inc other incredible things now. Uh, produces light 
that is an order of magnitude brighter than any star that we know of. Okay. This is another type of fusion reactor. Um, this is the purple stuff you see is plasma, which is another state of matter. So there's the solid state, liquid state, gas state, and then there's a plasma state, which is when things get so hot that all the little electrons that usually stick on there and hold chemical elements together uh, fall off and are free to roam around with the nuclei. And in this plasma state, everything is different. No model, liquid, gas, or solid model can actually replicate this because it's, it's another state of matter. Now in this plasma here, in order to try to, uh, in order to, first of all, in order to uh, produce fusion, they estimate that they need temperatures on the order of 100 million degrees Kelvin or Celsius. So that sounds like a lot. Um, to give people a sense of what that means, um, the sun, which is generally the thing, the hottest thing people can think of, uh, ranges, depending on where you're, whether it's the core or the surface, from 1 to 27 million degrees. So this is on the order of three times hotter than the sun. And because of the particular properties of this plasma, which is it's electromagnetic, it's charged, um, we are lucky because no metal can withstand that those type of temperatures because you sort of imagine that if you throw anything at the sun it will evaporate or um, vaporize or whatever you call that, um, annihilate. And, but I in an ideal way, this thing can be controlled by magnetic fields. So that's what you see right now. No wall is holding this in. This plasma is being held by magnetic fields. Now, there are actually other reactors, um, which I don't have a picture of, which, uh, like for example, at in New Mexico, there is a totally different principle um, being used for fusion called the Z-Machine, which produces 1.2 billion degrees. Um, this is yet another, this looks like an eyeball, I know, but it's actually a plasma ring, like a donut, and you're sort of looking through the top of it. Mm -hmm. And um, this, is, this is actually, uh, this is a, mm -hmm. a, an actual a picture from the 80s, but the same type of experiment is being is being conducted at, in New Jersey at a relatively small machine um, which is producing these plasma rings which are challenging all of physics today no model really can can figure out what is going on and that's very important the fact that one it's happening so it physically it's true but that physics doesn't account for it yet uh, they can, obviously, once it's there, they can sort of figure out some system to fit it, but they they don't forecast it from current physics, which is a very important factor to, to know whether your physics is right, is whether you can forecast what the next step is going to be, the next evolution is going to be. So I just want to get a, you know, a sense of what the domain of fusion really is. Because the, the domain of fusion is actually... Um, it's actually uh, in it encompasses all the things that they call high energy density physics and that a lot of things fit in that like lasers um, these hot plasmas and so on but a lot of them if not all of them are actually related to this specific search which is how to create fusion and what it's that that field alone has uh, like I pointed out, has challenged everything that we know. And um, there's a few other things that, besides the you know the 
the these physics laws, there's other things that really are challenged by by fusion. I'll give you one more or a couple more actually. So like the, I, this is a sort of a cartoon or a diagram of what's called a fusion torch. And this is an idea that's been around since the 80s, um, which is because metals cannot be, or because material cannot withstand those type of temperatures, like I think ceramic melts, um, most materials melt before 3,000 degrees. Um, so, and so the, the idea of this is to shoot uh, plasma from a fusion reactor, as you see, um, through an area where you can put your materials in. And this could be any material. Um, you know, the, the joke is that you can put the, the best ores that we have could actually be just sitting in landfills because landfills are full of things that human beings use. Um, but this is a, a good example where, you know, you can take almost any material, break it down into its, its elements. So break all of its chemical bonds, break it into elements, make pure materials again, and um, use the most unuseful th things for ore. And this was, like I said, this was designed in the 80s. This would completely redefine what we think our resources, what are what are what ores are. Um, and I'll just do show you one more. Do I have a picture of this? No, I actually don't have a picture. Um, I'll just get out of this. Uh, so I just want to point out to you one more thing of uh, just what this type of what what we're entering as a domain which isn't just fusion itself but is the society in which fusion is a common thing in which the uh, the energy densities and the control over the atom is as common as the control right now we have over chemical molecules um, where, you know, like for example, right now we can make almost any polymer we want. All, most uh, alloys we're very good at controlling um, surface material and so on. When you can have that type of control over the nucleus, that is going to be well. Uh, one of the characteristics of a new paradigm, which um, which would encompass being able to have fusion um, is having that type of control over the nucleus. And one more thing, the, the thing I wanted to mention was that um, desalination. So one of the major uh, one of the major holdups of desalination actually is power is just straight electricity. Uh, the electricity we have on the grid is used. It's not, there's not actually that much, there's not that much surplus. And so, now if you wanted to desalinate, say for example, the amount of water that you would require to uh, to alleviate the drought in the west, it would take a lot of power. Now the other thing is that once you start to desalinate water on that level, you start to do something that only the sun has ever done. So for people who haven't really thought about it before maybe, um, water is desalinated right now constantly and it's usually done by evaporation and the evaporation is done by uh, radiant heat. The work is done by radiant heat from the sun. So the sun is constantly de desalinating water and it's raining down. But we have not done that to that level. We have not done what the sun has done. But we can. And 
I think that really gives a, a uh, it's a similar similar concept to what I was pointing out earlier, being able to produce basically what the sun does, but in a within a room basically on Earth. You have a sun on Earth. So that's fusion, right? A complete redefining of what we think our resources, a complete redefining of what humans, uh, the relationship humans beings have to the solar system and to nature. And that is, like I said, that's much more than just getting more power, just getting more energy. It's power in a different stand from a different standpoint. It's not just you're not just going to get more electricity to do what you know today, and just be able to run your air conditioner longer or something. Um, you are going to get every single thing you know actually will change. And I could go through a lot of those, but I wrote a whole paper on it, and you can read that. It's called uh, Fusion: The Basics, Basic Economics, and um, and I obviously didn't list everything, but everything you know will change. And that's really the, the, the reason that you have a science driver. Um, that really is, that makes the difference between a new technology and a new system, basically, a new platform of activity from which everything is operating on. And this, this new platform, which is sort of uh, where fusion power is indicative of it, is, uh, you could call it a sort of a, a higher energy density platform. You know, the, the whole petroleum economy is a higher energy density platform than the wood burning economy. You could do much more. You could melt materials you couldn't before. You could do things with those hard materials and so on. Everything was, was ch changed. This is a, a similar shift. Although, well, not really. It, it's uh, of that order, but it's going to look nothing like that. Um, now, I want to get to helium-3. So that's, that's fusion, okay? Fusing of atoms, lots of power, but mostly just high energy density. Um, now, what's up with helium-3? So, let me see. Oh, you can't see this yet. Okay. So this is a diagram that um, of several different fusion reactions. So the most common one is the one at the top, the one, the one that most people are working with and you always start out your reactor with. Well, actually, that's not true. Most, pe most people start out their reactors with the, the second one, which is just two atoms of uh, a heavy hydrogen, which you can get from the oceans. Um, they fuse to produce these two different reactions. So two different types of hydrogen, they fuse to create um, for half the time, they produce a neutron and a helium-3. And the other half of the time, they produce hydrogen, regular hydrogen, the, the most abundant one, and one called tritium. And you can see these numbers, 3.3 and 4.0. Um, these won't really mean anything. These are energy measures. Uh, these are in mega electron volts, for those who know what that means. Um, look at these in comparison to the other ones, though. So the most, the one that most people are shooting for, though, is the one on top, number one. And deuterium and tritium, these are both, again, um, forms of hydrogen. And the reason that people choose hydrogen is because the lighter elements are actually easier to fuse. But so these are two sort of heavy versions of hydrogen. And they fuse to produce a neutron and a helium-4. Helium-4 is the most common type of helium two neutrons and two protons. Now, Mr. LaRouche is saying we should just go for this other one, not just go, um, the one at the very bottom. 
And right away you'll see, okay, so the, the one at the bottom is deuterium and helium-3. Deuterium is, again, a form of hydrogen, and then there's helium, this lighter form of helium, and it produces a hydro, hydrogen and helium-4. Okay, if you look at the numbers, 18.4 versus 17.6, you know, it seems like it's only a little bit more. Now, the, the difficulty of helium-3, which Don mentioned, is that uh, it burns at a higher temperature. It, uh, in order to get this reaction to react, it's actually it's higher than the first one, and which is the reason that most people start with deuterium and tritium. Um, they just think that you know why start with why work on helium three if you haven't gotten deuterium and tritium? That's a mo that's a very common thing I've I've gotten. And um, therefore, all the reactors right now are, most reactors right now are, are going for that. So why does Mr. LaRouche think that we should go for the helium-3 if all the fusion scientists are going for deuterium-tritium? And that's actually not a true statement, because not all the fusion scientists are going for deuterium-tritium. A lot of fusion scientists would actually like for, to go for deuterium-helium-3. And here's why. Um, so you see in the top react, the top one, the reactions come out to be. Uh, actually, I'm going to show you this next one. Okay, so this is actually pretty much the same graph, but in number form, less colorful. But the reason I want to show you this one is because. Um, it has these number breakdowns. So um, you see on top there's these these numbers 3.5 MeV and 14.1 14 MeV. Deuterium and tritium come out with this helium and neutron. Uh, the neutron is where most of the energy is, 14.1 MeV. And neutrons are a little funny. They are they can be great in some conditions um, because they're not charged, and they can be very pesky in others. Um, in energy production, they are incredibly pesky. And I'll give you a good example for people who have seen the Eater reactor. So the, this international tokamak or have heard about it or, or can look it up after after this. This is a giant reactor and it's the most expensive reactor we've ever produced. Um, and a large part of this reactor is 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 due to the fact that the reaction, the fusion reaction produces these these uncharged, uncontrollable because they're uncharged, so they can't be controlled by a magnetic field, neutrons. And these neutrons react with things. They sort of shoot out of the reactor and they react with things and they make everything radioactive. Now this is really not a problem in a fission reactor where you're just shooting the neutrons into water. Um, but in a fusion reactor, um, well anyway, in a fusion reactor you don't want to be doing that. And now, Eater, if you go look onto their website, they actually have this breakdown. It, it's a very nice interactive breakdown of what all the, all the parts are. And you'll see that most of the parts are diagnostics. They're shielding for neutrons and they're diagnostics because this whole thing has to be uh, unmanned because it's going to be radioactive. And so it has to be controlled from off-site. So that's very un inconvenient, let's say that. The second part of it is that because this is uncon these are uncontrolled neutrons, in order to produce energy out of this, you end up having to send it through water, letting it stop in water, making the water boil, and, um, oh, I have a picture. Uh, making the water boil, the water, the boiling water produces steam and it goes through a turbine. 
Um, this is actually a picture of a fission reactor. And that's what a fission reactor does. So a fission reactor produces these neutrons. Neutrons then heat up the water. Water turns into steam. Steam goes into a turbine. I talked to a couple of fusion reactors, right? Fu uh, sorry, fusion scientists, and uh, it's a very common term, <laughs> sort of very common thought, which is why use incredibly high energy neutrons to just boil water? Or you can boil water with coal or with almost anything. Why would you do that? You want to do something unique. You want to do something that, if you're going to go through the trouble of producing fusion, you want to be able to do something you could not do before with any amount of coal. And so, um, so, okay, let me go back to this other one. Okay. Now, if you look at this third row here between deuter deuterium and helium-3, you'll see that most of its energy comes out in a proton. So all of its products, there's mainly there's no neutrons. That's the main thing. And most of its energy comes out, a proton is basically hydrogen. Okay. So it comes out in a charged particle. It means that it can be, uh, it can be contained, it can be controlled, it can be directed, and it can be directly generate. It can be directly uh, converted to electricity because that's really what electricity is. Electricity is just moving charge. So why go through the the trouble of taking these <laughs> this electromagnetic plasma, which is already moving charges, and then converting it to heat, which is one of the most the oldest forms of energy and then producing electricity. You can produce electricity at almost 80, sort of 75 percent, 80 percent efficiency depending on what the reactor, uh, what type of apparatus you use. So that's one aspect of it is, is the fact that helium-3 will let us produce more electricity. Okay, now the other aspect is that helium-3 doesn't really exist in abundance on Earth. And I know a lot of people say, well, why do we want to use helium-3? Then why don't you use something else? Deuterium is in the water. Um, proton boron. Proton and, I mean, proton is just hydrogen. Hydrogen and boron is available on Earth. Why do you want to go to the moon, which is where it exists in abundance, um, to get this helium-3? And my sense of it is that My sense of it is that that's why you want the helium-3, because it's on the moon. Um, because it's on, a mo on the moon, it drives us to develop the moon. And this is very important because, uh, well, I don't know if people need it because, um, for the longest time now, so for... Um, let's see. By so, since the early '50s, we have been planning to go to the moon, and even much before that, there were there was a movie, a great movie, made in 1929. It was in 1919, uh, going through actually in pretty great detail the uh, the la a man landing on the moon, right? And since then, we did land a man on the moon. Uh, in 1969, a long time ago, um, and the the idea at that time was not to just bounce around, grab a couple moon rocks, and leave. That was not the idea. Um, the idea for everybody who was involved was we're going into space. This is the space age. This is this is like uh, this is uh, for a um, it was a uh, a great German um, space pioneer, Kraft Erika. He likened it to when life emerged out of the oceans. 
Or he's also likened it to um, when you come out of the womb. And so I sort of come out of Earth's womb and uh, expand out into space and grow. And so this is not something new. We've It's been very clear that human beings can and therefore must um, expand beyond Earth, should develop the solar system, have the capability to, and uh, have just been sitting on our butts fighting wars and who knows what else. So in, in some sense the lunar helium-3 part is, is simply a driver for now because one, you know, no source of fuel is the ultimate source of fuel. You know, they have these estimates that say that the helium-3 on the moon is enough to last us 10,000 years. Now, that's probably based on some estimate based on uh, that, that is, um, that uses current amounts of electricity use and maybe a current level of uh, population growth. But that's not going to stay the same. If we're actually a developing world, then that's not going to stay the same. So even 10,000 years is, well, first of all, that's a limited time. And second of all, um, it will probably be much less than that. But third of all, um, that's not going to last us to even the uh, the extinction of the sun. So that is only, it's sort of, okay, it's sort of, uh, you've been in these projects where you say, okay, by Friday we've got to get this part done. And that's, so you're a driver, okay, yeah, we can get that part done, but that's not the end goal. The end goal is something higher. And, but, Mr. LaRouche has pointed out that helium-3 is something we know we can get to. We, it's not that we know we can get to. It's, it's a goal in which if you organize the, the activity of today to get to something just a little beyond our reach right now, then everything will be organized. Everything will be reorganized um, to drive from, to, that, to that goal, at least. Um, and one thing I want to point out is that, um, you know, um, people have all, I've heard this funny argument about jobs. <laughs> you know, I, I talked to this guy in Houston who, um, who said, okay, yeah, fusion, but do you support the Keystone Pipeline? <laughs> And the, I knew the reason he was asking is because he probably works uh, in that field. But I want to ask you, so first of all, how many people is it going to take to send rockets to space and mine the moon? And all the different, not just that aspect of it, but all the different supporting elements of that. And then the question, then the other question is, what type of people? And it's, you know, are, uh, compare the amount of people, for example, that are, that are required for coal mining to the amount of people that you would need. I actually calculated these numbers, but I didn't bring them um, for mining helium-3. You do need actually a lot more people for the latter, but the most important, important part is the the, the people are going to be are going to understand the universe and have much more power in the universe than the former. And this is really much more of what Mr. LaRouche is is thinking about as a new era. It's not a technology. It is this new era that he's that he's uh, this new era and this new um, this change relationship of human beings to the rest of the solar system and to the universe and to physical laws. Um, and what he's saying right now is that, that that era is is 
is has a very high potential of being brought in right now with leadership. And he keeps on pointing out that there's all these developments and you know they're not unlawful. These are things that Mr. LaRouche has been pushing for for quite a long time. Um, but that at the same time, this is it's a it's an interesting era because the uh, <laughs> Ben pointed out the vacuum in uh, in leadership is more intense, is more vacuous than uh, space, and that is that then comes down to comes back to the the, the Fiona, yeah you are brushing up against your microphone without realizing it and it's that's being broadcast okay okay thank you anyway I'm, I'm just um, wrapping up here it's it comes back to the the subject that I started with which is our role in all this the whole in in the whole strategic situation this current strategic situation is actually very it's very exciting, but at the same time, it's very um, dynamic. It can go either way, and uh, as it has this very high potential to shift into this new renaissance. And at the same time, it has this high potential for Obama, for Blair, to just say, "We've lost our control. We can," and just push the button. And so. In that sense, there there is one the timely aspect to it, but then at the same time, it, there has to be a a sense of uh, what it means to win. Like, what are we working for? What is what is the you can say what is the purpose of mankind? Um, and that really is the the quality of leadership that we that needs to be. Uh, leading right now, and it doesn't right now exist in uh, where it traditionally is and should be, which is in the the presidency, and the in around the presidency. We've gotten clear indications from um, uh, the institutions of the presidency that there will be backup. There could there that people do want this type of activity, but no one is going to take it up. Like Reagan did during the SDI, and so, uh, but there is still a clear uh, sort of green light to say, okay, do this. So that's that's where I want to leave it off. It's um, you know, like I said, nothing is determined, but if you can get a sense of what all the factors are. Um, that's what we are determining. So I want to leave it at that, and hopefully something came across, and um, we'll take up the rest in questions or comments. Don't all rush to the mic at once. Okay, hi. Miona, um, well, one question I have is uh, the question of, um, I mean, you might have answered this, but I, I just wanted to, you know, the, um, the power of fusion versus fission uh, in, in, in terms of what, what, the, what the actual you know, how much more powerful is it? And I realize that the process of creating a fusion reaction is a, a, a completely, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, complete, a completely new, it, we, don't, we don't really know exactly how we're going to do it. Um, but the process of creating a fusion reaction is going to develop all kinds of discoveries in and of itself. But I think my question has been, 
the, you know, in the organizing, we tended to say fusion is so much more powerful than fission and, and that kind of thing. And I think it's kind of, um, you know, we don't really know what we're talking about. <laughs> And so I was wondering uh, if you could enlighten us on that. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll just go back to this. Oh, actually, let's see if I have this image. So uh, I know this is a little small, but in the numbers you there, you see um, this is per pound, and it's a little bit deceiving because most uranium we use in reactors is only about 7%, 7 to 10% actual fuel. The rest of it is non-burning fuel. But um, I use pure fuel here. <laughs> um, so you see that in this case, fusion is only four times that of fission. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, energy-wise, you know, that's not really a good argument. Um, the direct conversion aspect, which is being able to use the plasma itself instead of go having to go through, uh, you know, instead of having to go through the whole neutron boiling process, and you know, boiling is a very old technology. <laughs> um, uh, but instead of having to go through that, if you are able to use the plasma itself to produce electricity, that's that's much better. But you're right, the other thing is that, uh, well, there's, there's two things. Um, one is that uh, fusion itself does a lot more, and I'll, I'll give you a good example. Um, there's a reactor, the Z-Pinch machine in Sandia, which is in New Mexico, um, it produces x-rays, and in the process of trying to produce fusion. They realize it did this and it's supposed to be a bad thing, but they figured out it does this and so they designed their reactor to produce an extreme amount of x-rays for use. So they sort of flip the problem around. And you can produce all sorts of different uh, frequencies for materials processing, for all sorts of things. In their case, they actually, you know, they're, they're a weapons lab, so they use it for met, um, defense purposes, but um, you can use it for all sorts of industry. Mm -hmm. That's one aspect. But the other thing is that we have actually gone, we have been, we're far from tapping fission. Uh -huh. And not just in energy. Um, you know, you've seen all of these, maybe you have or haven't seen these old movies, these um, Adams for Peace movies. No, you should look them up. They're, they're from Eisenhower's period, and so these are Adams for Peace movies, and you know, this is shortly after the bomb, so this is trying to get the population to understand that um, nuclear power, uh, the, the nucleus can be other than the bomb. And uh, it has these, these uh, ex examples of people using... Um, neutrons for transmutation, for creating isotopes, for medical isotopes, um, for industrial purposes where you can sort of shoot them through. They show this process of uh, producing very thin metals, evenly thin metals, by shooting radiation through it. Mm -hmm. You can detect how thick it is. And, you know, now people use that for uh, Coca-Cola, uses it for figuring out when they're um, the bottle is full, <laughs> the cereal box is full, and so on. So they just had a, all, this whole series of videos showing the population what the power of the atom is. Now, we do use some of that stuff now. We use a lot of all the medical technology. I mean, all the radioisotopes are generated either from um, uh, these few particle accelerators or just actually from fission reactors. Um, but that's far from uh, from being completely controlled. I think part of fusion is this. Part of fusion is completing that cycle of sort of completing that picture of 
full control over the atom. So we can fission. So we have a capability of certain amounts of transmutation of, of sort of changing the elements, but we can't. We haven't. We do fusion. That's you know. It's not that we don't do it. It's just we haven't produced enough energy out of it to produce extra energy. But people do do fusion. But having that type of control over the atom um, is going to require all of that. It's going to require that fission is just is much more than just producing, you know, electricity. For example, mm -hmm. like for example, the fast flux test facility, they were doing all sorts of things before it was shut down. But yeah, so I, I think you're right. It's it's the this the you know we had a uh, we talked to a fusion scientist who. Um, he caught himself playing this line that fusion is so much better than fission because it's non-radioactive and uh, produce and so on. And he said he dropped that. He doesn't use that anymore because this is not true. <laughs> not because it's not true as in it's higher energy, but um, first of all, it tritium is radioactive. So the current um, the current, you know, deuterium and tritium, tritium is radioactive, and so anybody who's going to complain about fission reactors is also going to complain about fusion. <laughs> so all these greenies are also going to hate fusion. I know that they, a bunch of them, think that they like fusion right now, but they're all going to hate it <laughs> um, for the same reasons that they argue about fission right now. But yeah, I think it, 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 it is really. It's this. We got to think about these domains. Yeah. of control and not technologies like fission power is a technology mm -hmm. okay cool. yep it's a lot to learn <laughs> okay we have another question oh. a couple more questions Hi. Hi. I understand. I understand the importance of helium-3 energy, which is definitely going to serve the future generation well. However, at present, many part of the world is experience, experiencing with drought. Is there any technology of helium-3 can help to improve the water resources? Yeah, I think the drought situation is a really good example because, um, honestly, the drought would not exist if we had not prevented fusion from being developed in the 80s, 70s, and 80s. And uh, that's some we put a, some material out on that as far as how fusion has been completely suppressed um, right when it made its breakthroughs in the late 70s. Um, but honestly, you know, the, the fact that we have so little control over an understanding over the water cycle is absurd. And um, now you see, you know, people are finally starting to understand some of the, the ionospheric influences of the weather, and most importantly, the solar influences of the weather. And so, you know, people think that um, people think that weather comes from weather. <laughs> you know, without the sun, we would have no weather. Actually, without the sun, we would have no life. But without the sun, we would have no weather. And so um, that is one aspect is that we have very little understanding of that type of process. Now, as far as the current drought goes, okay, think of yourself as the president. What would you do right now in this in the course of this drought? And I ask that because well, first of all, think really think about it. Because I'm not saying that helium 3 is going to solve everything. What I am saying is that there's no shortcut 
development is the only answer. Now, as you saw with, for example, Roosevelt's period, if you really want to get stuff done, you just get it done. And so, like, you know, these frackers, they bring in tons of trucks of water. If you were serious about resolving this drought, of, in this drought crisis, I mean, the first thing you could, you could do is just bring in trucks of water. Now, that's the most inefficient thing you could possibly do, but if you are dealing with people who are dying, starving, or the land is being parched, that may be the first thing you do while you're building desalination plants, which takes a year or two. That is something you can do, is build desalination plants with current nuclear power. And people have estimated if you actually didn't have uh, you know, environmentalists pick picketing outside of your nuclear plant, uh, you might be able to build these in two to three years, especially with, if you built modular nuclear plants. Um, and then in the, in the longer term, we do have to start understanding how these droughts actually occur. Where, why is it that there is this disparity between floods happening in the east and drought happening at the same exact time on, in the west? Um, there have been these studies where you, they showed that the greening of the Central Valley actually brought rain into the, the Four corner states. Or the greening of Imperial Valley also lowered the temperature in that area by three degrees. And, and so on. And so th there are these, these ex sort of ex un, un, ex um, unexpected experiments that we have performed where we've seen that uh, large weather patterns are really not that um, uh, un, not that they're not uncontrollable, but they're not they're not magic. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's a mountain range, and therefore <laughs> the weather stops there, and so on. These are the type of things we can understand and control. If we need to plant a big forest like Israel did in the middle of the desert, then we'll do it. Um, Roosevelt planted a giant row, a wall of trees down the middle of the country <laughs> to stop the Dust Bowl. Did you have any ideas? <laughs> Thank you, yes. <laughs> but yeah, like I said, that helium-3 is more of a driver, you know. It's a driver for development overall. Hi. Oh, did you have a question from San Francisco, Mark? No? Okay. Okay, hi. Hello. Uh, the nation of Iran. Yeah. Are they for fusion energy? And because they seem to get along with China very well, uh, I'm assuming that they're cooperating and they're on the bandwagon uh, with fusion energy. So that's my question. And then I may as well add in uh, other countries like Egypt, Syria, Lebanon. Of course, Syria is in the middle of a war, but ultimately, um, Jordan, Lebanon, Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, what is their attitude about it? Are they at least interested? I actually don't know. That is something, I could look that up for you, but I, I don't know. I don't know of any, in other words, I don't know of any major um, uh, operations that are occurring there but they could be interested. Okay, but Iran at least uh, doesn't seem like they're, they're in the right direction. It seems that they're going for fission, definitely. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know to what extent they have developed the capability for fusion yet. Okay. All right. Thank you. If you find out, you can tell me. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see a hand. No, I actually can't hear you. Can you come up? 
This is not a solution. This is just to apply time. A first step would be, I would think, desalinization of parts of the ocean for the drought. Yeah, you're saying that would be a good first first step. You're saying. Um, a, a, a device to, to buy time while they're developing more sophisticated means of um, for developing energy. Yeah, I think you're right. Okay, that was my simple idea. Okay. <laughs> you know, what's, I, what's very sick, actually, is that California has plans um, for, I think it's 14 nuclear desalination plants, uh, but they're never going to be built in this condition. In this type of insanity, in this type of leadership, they're just, they're just not going to be built. And that's, that's what I mean about this era, is it's really not a technology question, you know? It's not a really a capability to, for example, build. There are going to be some problems. We don't really actually have a whole lot of nuclear uh, operators in the U.S. because we don't have a lot of nuclear energy. Um, so there will actually be physical constraints as far as how fast you can build these things, but the real constraints are, are political. Well, I would think that under the circumstances, which are getting worse and worse, I mean, just to, to watch the progression of the climate this year, seeing all the, all the water and ice is on the, in the northeast, and all the drought is in the far west. So this would bring some kind of mental, apolitical fusion. A mental what? This would bring some kind of um, apolitical fusion. Just out of necessity. Uh huh. A, a, you know, a strong meeting of minds. Mm -hmm. And the possibility of other sources, much more productive sources of energy, would um, take away all these politics because that becomes irrelevant. Yeah, well, that's the point. Yeah, is is I mean, part of the that's part of the point, which is you know, this is what Mr. Lewis is, is saying is that. What we're talking about right now is the things that actually have real value. Um, as far as money-wise, I mean, these things can cost, you know, in on the order of a few billion dollars total. And, you know, I'll give you a good example. Um, the over the past since 2006, which is when uh, during Bush's term, uh, when the whole uh, renewable resources thing really shot off, and the renewable resources really shot off during like right at the beginning of Bush's period, um, especially the biofuels. Since then, they've spent over a hundred billion dollars on renewables. Now, if you look at the actual energy grid and look at how much renewables contributes to it, it's a joke. <laughs> um, but the other thing is that you know the most expensive nuclear reactor that is is out there that people complain about is twenty five billion dollars. Most of them require about well, there's one that's asking for literally two hundred thousand dollars. You know, if you want a sense of how much that is, um, that's like a house, right? Or not now, I guess, not in the housing bubble, but about 10 years ago, that was about a house. Um, there's another one that's asking for $2 million. Um, 
to break even, okay? To like start producing electricity or to show that you can produce electricity. So it it does show that it's it breaks the value thing. That's right. Um, but at the same time, I have to say that you know it's it is this interplay. It's not automatic. It's not automatically that somebody who gets fusion is going to then break this whole system. There, there is still going to be a political fight because, um, you know, we've had a case where um, somebody got very close and uh, there was a major operation to make sure that uh, it never went totally through. So we have to understand what the real fight is, like for example, you know, most people don't think of fusion as a political fight, but when you know that it has to happen for the human species to exist beyond the star, but beyond after the sun extinguishes, then uh, then you know what you need to fight for. That was a little more than you asked, but some things I hadn't thought of. So you think, you think that part of the political dysphoria is that they're afraid of, um, they're too afraid of money and the, you know, dynamics of huge amounts of money that would be helpful for things. No, I think part, most of the dynamic is, most of the dynamic is going, is actually our understanding of where we should be right now. It's going to be determined by that. Versus the, the rules that have governed the game, which is what makes money. Is there, are there questions from San Francisco or no? Otherwise, we could keep taking questions from LA. Okay, thank you. Uh huh. Thank you. So, uh, Leona, uh, San Francisco tips at our. Uh, uh, can you hear us clearly there? He said no. I mean, he said there are no questions, I think. No, I said I'm asking you if you can hear. Oh, I can. I, 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 yeah, there is. Um, are you muted on my end? I just muted Mark now. You have to unmute yourself now. I am not muted. Okay. Okay. So do we have any uh, San Francisco questions or how do we want to do this? He said that we cannot hear him. You are unmuted. Okay. Try speaking, Mark. Um, I can hear you very lightly. How about you call me and just tell me what the question is? There you go. Okay. Okay, what is your question? How is what design different from what design? Oh, are helium three designs different than current designs, and are um, how are they different? Is that your question? Yeah. And the, the second question was, um, what is the status of the research in China supposed to be about? 
Okay, in China there are 2,000 people being trained for fusion. Uh, what is the status here in the United States? Okay. You can stay on if you want. Okay. Okay, so um, my se so there are certain reactors which are more prone to be able to run helium-3 and the main thing is being able to be hotter, denser, and so on. This is, according to Mr. LaRouche, there actually are other considerations which people have not taken up. Um, uh, but according to sort of current understanding, the ones that are hotter, denser, and so on could take helium-3. And these include, for example, um, a lot of the ones that these startups are, are doing. So there's a startup in uh, Irvine, which is this called Tri-Alpha. There's a startup in New Jersey. Um, and the key with them is that they're using these plasmas that are what are considered self-confined. Self and so they use a, a plasma configuration, which is uh, producing its own uh, it's producing its own confinement. In other words, it's generating its own magnetic fields and instead of making itself more turbulent, it's actually making itself more uh, focused. And I think these ones, the ones that are using the, the sort of personality of the plasma itself to act on itself, these are the ones that have a real, are, uh, are getting very good results with very small reactors I generally think that all of the reactor designs could have helium-3 um, with advances. And, you know, there is a tokamak design that could win Wisconsin that they are working on, which they think they're, they're the biggest proponents of helium-3 uh, fusion. And then, like for example with the laser facility, you know, they just, they have to, they have to get their stuff together, basically, and, but once they get it, I mean, as far as maybe getting more powerful lasers, that stuff, they, they've already done that. The lasers that they have installed there, they're, they're old now, compared to the lasers they've already designed, so if that's the, per so anyway, I'm just saying that, as far as designs goes, no, there's not really a difference. There are some that are more prone and there are some that are smaller, which is a big advantage. Um, one thing about, like I said, with uh, no neutrons is if you have no shielding and all sorts of things, it's, it can be much smaller. A lot of the ones that depend on this, on helium-3, are built much smaller and can be used for nuclear rockets, which is very important. Nuclear rockets can take you far in very short amount of time in a point time when you will not become a pile of jelly because your bones have deteriorated. Um, the second question is the status of US uh, students. Now this is actually a very sad story because uh, now I've gone to several institutions and spoken with fusion scientists and I've run into several young people who have said, who are working in fusion of some sort and have said they're going to get out of it uh, because just, there just no, is no future in the United States for fusion. And, um, you know, like everything else, it's a year-to-year -year funding. Um, there's a great reactor in MIT which was shut down and they gave it two more years of funding so that the graduate students that are working on it now can finish. In other words, in other words, it will shut down, supposedly under current the current plan, in two years. Um, there was I've met uh, there was a scientist who has had two full projects which were in full, were, which were full blown, which one day was just announced that it was dead no more, everyone must go, everyone's fired. 
And so it, it does create a condition where no young people <laughs> want to go into it. Um, that's unfortunately the status of, of uh, our, the U.S. Uh, education of new sci fusion scientists. Which is also it's also creates sort of a time time limit because eventually the old people are going to retire and pass away, which has actually happened to a large extent. And the fusion know-how, which the whole world depends on, from the United States, right? China got its fusion know-how from the United States. Um, will just not be there. But um, so anyway, that's that's part of the timing. You it has to be considered uh, as far as how how you would bring new students in. I would imagine you would want something like a CCC. Other thing is, I have asked fusion scientists how many graduate students can you take max <laughs> each. trying to get an estimate of just how fast we could graduate new scientists. Are you trying to ask a question there, Jim? Or Pat? Okay. Leona. Yeah. That's Pat. Can you hear me? Hi. I hear you. She doesn't hear me. I do hear you. Oh, can you hear us? No. I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> All right, I was going to return to the draw. Uh, in the previous question from here, uh, I think it needs some context. And, and we want to go back to the time of John Kennedy. And in 1963, Kennedy set up a task force to begin uh, building nuclear desalination plants in Texas and in California. Mm -hmm. and in fact, even after Kennedy was assassinated in 1964, the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, which is virtually the entirety of Southern California, signed a contract with the Atomic Energy Commission to blueprint and build the first nuclear desalination plant to be constructed in Southern California. And it was to be online, producing energy, producing fresh water by 1970. Right? The, that idea, along with uh, the space program that was supposed to go to Mars, you know, all were thrown in the garbage can as the United States shifted in the late 60s and into the 70s to the cultural revolution that destroyed you know, the idea of progress in our population. Right? And, and so the, the idea of, of the science driver for fusion you know, is absolutely political because it was the adoption of essentially a British monetarist financial system in the early 1970s you know, of dumping the American system of production and development that has given us the world we have today and had the program actually continued, you know, the drought today would, would just be a little blip on, on the political screen. Mm -hmm. but, so now addressing the current drought and the current situation, you have the entire political class of California uh, essentially saying everybody should conserve and pray for rain. Yeah, do now, a rain dance. The problem is it may not rain <laughs> and there may not be anything to conserve. Right? So uh, that is not too good of a uh, policy that, that might work. Right? Uh, conservation, thing, same thing. If, you, if there is no water to conserve, well, uh, you're in a dead end again. And therefore, 
a literally a crash program of nuclear desalination of building a hundred such plants along the coast of California is the only medium-term solution. There is no short-term solution except for trucking some water, but the drought is so devastating and so serious, you could never truck enough water in to put back into production a half a million acres of farmland in the Central Valley. Right? So, you know, it, you've got to actually address this from the standpoint of reality. And the reality is, unless you are determined to actually solve the problem, mm -hmm. uh, even short-term measures really won't do too much. Yeah, yeah. You only can you only do the short-term measures in the context of a long-term solution. Hey, Otherwise, you, hold on. Okay, go ahead, please. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Exactly. You those short-term measures that I mentioned, for example, they don't make any sense unless you have a long-term plan ready to go. Because those are very, very short. Like for example, like you said, trucking. I mean, those are that's a very ridiculous way that they they do for for example for fracking but you know I, that's what I was I gave an example of if you really needed to do it you could do it <laughs> it's not really you know but yeah you're right it it does all have to be um, it has to be scaled out if if the fastest we can build a, a, a fusion or a, a desalination plan is about two years as we two to three years then Mm -mm. We, you know, we have to figure out what what all the time scales are. I think um, there are these people who have worked on bringing uh, rain from the coast inland with these ionization systems. How long that takes, I don't know, but we should put that into the the timetable as far as um, that goes. You know, is it going to be before? Is it going to be after? Um, but yeah, I think we should take it all into consideration. And then, obviously, like you said, if Kennedy had had it his way, we would not be in this mess at all. Hi, Gerald. Hey there. Let me plug the uh, better mic. I'm getting plugged. I can hear him. Okay. Okay. Um, when the Fusion Energy Foundation was founded in the 70s, there was still a lot of belief in this country in science and technological progress. I mean, we could go out to the airports at O'Hare in Chicago or LA or Denver, anywhere else, and we sold 100, 200,000 subscriptions, and people were wildly excited about it. Right. And then I remembered this, and I just looked this up and printed it out. This is from the LA Times 25 years ago, April 19, 1989, titled, Fear of Fusion, What If It Works? <laughs> and it was, they quoting three people. One was Paul Ehrlich, the author of The Population Bomb from Stanford. The other was a guy named Jeremy Rifkin. And the third was a guy named John Holdren. This is 25 years ago. Wow. And what they're saying is the biggest freaking problem is, here's uh, some of the quotes from Rifkin, it's the worst thing that could happen to our planet, fusion. Um, Ehrlich, it, having the prospect of cheap, inexhaustible energy from fusion is like giving a machine gun to an idiot child, says Paul Ehrlich. And then they quote uh, Holdren, with, Holdren with similar things. So... It seems like the issue is really what you pointed to earlier when you uh, were hypothesizing why Lynn thinks this going to the moon is really the key, because it will unite all the nations, and, and that the BRICS developments already is making optimism about science and the future is becoming the coin of the realm, like, you know, for the half and more of the world. Mm -hmm. and that seems to be the most important thing to address is why have people become so damn pessimistic? You know, I had a guy tell me today, I, I'm not kidding you, mm -mm. that Obama was planning to move the White House to Kenya, 
changed the name to the Black House from the White House, and then and then he was going to have 250 elite troops ready to shoot and kill anyone who objected to it. And the guy, you know, was seriously believing it. You know, so so my my question really is, you know, it seems like we really got to address this fundamental philosophical question of the relationship of science and optimism for the future. And a related question, although I don't know if you have an answer to this, one of the things that we used to think about also was how science could it increase the longevity of life. That is, we need some of these scientists who are the <laughs> ones who kept knowledge alive. You know, they need to live 150 years, you know, 120 years to be able to give their full contributions to humanity. And I'm just wondering how that's affecting the whole scientific fusion and other things today that we need to have uh, you know knowledge preserved and developed for the future okay you're back on mm -hmm. you know I I um, um, I had this hypothesis in writing my article uh, which is that or it was actually a sort of a paradox that I ran into, which is, do you educate people first in heading toward the science driver or the other way around? Um, because I was thinking about Roosevelt and how he sort of just put people to work. But then he also had the Civilian Conservation Corps, which taught people how to write their names um, and so on. And I think there is that aspect as well. There is an aspect where the actual the acting out of uh, the sort of being in the the system of progress also gives you optimism. Um, you know, you always I always meet Chinese scientists or just Chinese people who are um, especially from this who are a little younger who have known nothing but progress, right? Because their lifetime is in, within the span in which China has been progressing. Um, and so there, I think there's that aspect of it, is don't expect the, the next generation to, to be nearly the same. But then I think, yeah, and then the, as far as cur the current population is going to really take some, some, um, some fighting with. Because you know, experience says all the things that uh, that uh, confirm people's pessimism. But at the same time, people see we're not pessimistic. So I think this also gets at what Mr. LaRouche got was so so um, adamant about months ago, which is experience doesn't tell you much. <laughs> You've never experienced being on Mars, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be there. <laughs> um, this other thing about being keeping people alive, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I think it's... Um, I do think there are a lot of... I mean, you know, the funny thing about the healthcare system it may not even be exactly what you're asking about, but I know the thing about the healthcare system is that the healthcare system always has in, has advanced through uh, the highest sort of always through our drivers, our technology drivers, and so the first major advance in, uh, for example, the U.S. healthcare system is actually through the space program, and you know all of the um, uh, the, the space program and the fusion program, most of our medical technology came from those two in some kind of combination. Uh, largely because the, the space program was the first time you had to keep a human, a human being alive completely outside of the environment that you know, where you're just sort of swimming in everything that you need to survive. <laughs> but um, 
you know, they obviously they had to take heart measurements and pulse measurement, uh, things that they never had really considered. But all that went into nucle into medical technology. And there's an interesting one, which is um, this fusion guy who produced a oh, what is it called? It's called a balloon. Maybe people know. It's, it's for your arteries to unclog the arteries. Anyway, but. Um, so I think this is it's it, it that is always the trend is when you push these limits, you also um, one you understand life more, but then two is just it always feeds in in that way. But I do think a lot of these diseases we we still uh, die from are are still very third world. What's that? Yeah, okay. uh, I will. So, Leona, can you hear us here? Yes, I can. Um, I think it may be time to cut the yeah. room. Um, uh, we thank you very, very much. Um, it's already 12.10 for you, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, good. I hope you guys got something out of that. Yes. We got Definitely. lots out of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>